Thank you so much for joining Dental Marketing Theory, a podcast by Gary Bird. In today's episode, Gary sits down with Dr. Mark Faber. Gary and Dr. Mark discuss how Dr. Mark has purchased five, yes, five, dental practices off of Craigslist and how he navigates finding hidden opportunities in the dental world. As always, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment, as all of those things really help to get the word out about dental marketing theory. Hope you enjoy today's show. All right, we are live. Thanks so much for tuning in to Dental Marketing Theory. And before I get into the episode today, which I got a special one for you, and I promise you you're going to hear some things you've never heard before in the dental industry. But before we get into that, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go just leave me a quick review, whatever you're listening on. If you're on YouTube, just give it a thumbs up. If you're on any of the podcast platforms, just go leave it five stars. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who listen to this, but we only have about 100 reviews and we need more reviews. So that would really help us out. It is free. It doesn't cost you anything and you can literally do it while you still listen to the show. And today I have my friend, Dr. Faber. It's so good to have you on today and I want to kick us off like this. You told me a story. I heard you actually, I heard you tell it on on a platform. I heard you tell it up in front of an audience how one day you bought a dental practice off of Craigslist. Yep. Well, I, I, I think I bought five at this point off of Craigslist. Five. And, so you. Uh, so this wasn't just a one time I got lucky and got a, a, a practice off of Craigslist. These are five practices. Please explain that to me. I, I don't think anybody else has ever done that before. If they have, I, I've never met them. Uh, how, how did you buy five practices off of Craigslist? Well, well, it's what you're buying. So uh, um, I'm... I know I look for practices where there's a lot of upside. And so the bigger practices, easy to sell, either a doctor could sell it on their own or you have a broker that gets, you know, will get you top dollar for it. Then there's these practices that kind of fall through the cracks. And sometimes, you know, a broker will, will uh, post on, on Craigslist, but very often a doctor then, you know, gets dropped by the broker. No one could sell it. And then, and then I, uh, you know, I find it on the bottom of the internet on Craigslist. <laughs> And these are pre- so these, these are, are doctors who are literally just posting their office. Like, does anybody want to buy a dental office? Correct, and, correct, and, some, and sometimes it's brokers too. Um, but it's but it's not it's not the practices that uh, a lot of the larger DSOs are interested in. Yeah, so it's, let's it's so let's talk through practices. that. So you're looking through. So everybody wants the you know the EBITDA on these practices and the, the upside opportunity. And you're looking, and they're looking at very specific things to be able to capitalize on that upside. What are you looking at to be able to know, hey, I can capitalize on the upside of these practices? I'm looking for the low hanging fruit. Uh, these are a lot. These are practices when you look at their product, when you get their production report, if they have practice <laughs> management software. Got it. Um, and if you know, and you'll notice that most of these practices are still using traditional x-rays, you know, dipping film still. Uh, but you'll know, you'll see that these these offices are not optimized. They're not taking X-rays. They're not diagnosing enough. Uh, they're underdiagnosing. Um, a lot of these doctors are not doing root canals. They're not doing extractions. They're not doing implants. Some of them, most of these don't. Most of these doctors do not have hygienists as well. And so I, I know coming into these practices that that I could buy it for probably less than the cost to build it, and put it in my systems and turn around this practice around really quickly. Got it. So you you are looking for things that other people aren't looking at. Now, the thing that would scare me with that, right, if they don't have practice management and they don't have some of the traditional things that we're used to, to being able to kind of pour through and do our due diligence, how do you do your due diligence on these offices to make sure you're you're not striking out? Well, there, again, there's there's low risk on these things, on these offices. I'm, I'm not spending, you know, a fortune on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but again, you you know, you look at all the things. You look at their tax returns. You look at their the production reports. You could you do a little what I call reconnaissance, where you where you go around to see actually people are going in over there, um, and you as long as there's patient flow, then you, you you'll you could figure out that hey, this is this office is just not doing what's supposed to be doing, and there's just a ton of opportunity over there. Um, the, for example. Uh, most recently, we bought an office like this that was doing maybe two hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue. Hmm. Um, so we bought during COVID a year, two fifty a year, our, right? Yeah, two fifty a year. But we came in and we knew we knew what was going on over there from you know looking at different reporting and what we were able to get our hands on. 
But in our first 12 months over there, we did over a million dollars in revenue because just from these low hanging, just, just, so just from went, do nothing special here. Yeah, no, so, no, no, not in design. No, no, wasn't even any implants over there. Just regular dentistry. So, so, so you went from 20,000 on that particular office, you went from 20,000 to $80,000 a month in 12 months. And what did you, did you upgrade the office at all? Or did you have, how much money did you have to like sink into we, that? We put in one chair. Uh, we put in, you know, our, our, our IT, our computers, mm. we got a digital x-ray and a, and a Cerex scanner. That's, you know, that's, that's basically it. That's was so a, awesome. not, 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 a, not a, not a lot of, not a lot of an investment, but, but we know that again, I've, I've seen this off these type of offices hundreds of times already. Um, and these are practice. And the other thing that's nice about these are practices that nobody else wants. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you nobody. is like, you're probably doing these, these doctors are probably really relieved that you're buying them from, cause they're probably thinking I'm going to have to let this go and no one's going to buy it from me. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't call it a fire sale, but like, there's just nobody, no, nobody, I don't think anybody else sees the value. Like I see it mm -hmm. or, or, or is willing to put in the effort that it would take to turn it around. Sometimes it's easier to keep a, uh, uh, you know, a, a steady office moving along and, and you have that good cash flow, but the upside on this is is that you know you, you, you know I'm, I'm i'm quadrupling my money usually and i mean early on in my career I had, I had real trouble that with banks because i was growing so fast they wouldn't give me enough money to, even though these were small these were small offices they couldn't they couldn't understand what i was doing yeah uh you know and you know uh, i had think you know i'm not, not going to throw any banks under under the bus <laughs> yeah, on this no, podcast but <laughs> but 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 the truth is they, they had a hard time uh growing at first because uh i didn't have a proven concept yeah they didn't and understand the business model they didn't understand the business model and and even though they had all my deposits and they saw that you know through a half of the year that i've already surpassed the previous doctor's uh income they still wouldn't lend me on that it was really it was very frustrating did the tables turn like did that change over time when the finally the bank's like oh okay we get it now we see you've, you've, you have a track record with us no we switched banks okay got <laughs> it. it smart smart so then so, so tell me this dr paper like why are, why do you think this way and nobody else thinks this way and in, in your at least in your market like why aren't people well, what i mean no people there are there's definitely other people in the country doing this i'm not the only one doing this no there's no way um uh, and maybe, maybe trying to do this on scale is a little bit harder. Um, but, uh, but I'm, but you know, from my conversations with, with various DSOs, a lot of DSOs started this way where they bought smaller practices and built them up. Uh, and at a certain, at a certain point they did pivot and they went and they went for the larger buys because, mm. because it was easier for it's them. Faster. Um, yeah. It's faster. Um, it's faster. I mean, remember we're not, when I go in there, we kick out the, the doctor's gone immediately. We don't want him there. Got it. Okay. So you're not doing that. the whole, we're trying to keep the doctor, we're trying to keep the team. You're, are you refurbishing the Correct. whole team too? Um, no, we're trying to, we try to keep on as many staff members as possible. Um, usually there's only one, you know, it's not like a, yeah. it's usually not a, a massive uh, crew, but, but we, 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 we do try to keep on uh, employees and I've had, not, I've had employees now working with me for, you know, six, seven years that we've, that we've, that came over in our purchase and they're, they're fantastic. No, um, I've, I've never asked you this before, but what is, what is your vision? Like, where do you see this going in the next five to 10 years? If you could kind of see that folding, unfolding <laughs> me personally, or, or just dentistry as a whole, like, no, you just you. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I mean, I have a, I have a very good team. Uh, I have re really good partners. Um, we have a strong, uh, culture, and we feel that we could kind of conquer whatever we set our minds to. Um, so this is what we're doing now is low risk. It's, you know, we could, we could, we could probably do this, do one or two or three of these deals a year at some point, um, and continue to grow really nicely, uh, you know, and not having, and not, and not really take on crazy amounts of debt and not really uh, rock the boat that much. Um, but I don't know, we'll see, we may, we may, we may pivot. It really is a question of how, how, you know, what our, you know, what our collective vision is. I don't have, it's not, it's not clear right now. Right now I know for the next two, three years, what I'm doing after that, who knows? So what's the next two, three years look like? What's the roadmap? Like if we were on the, if we're, I was on your team, what would your vision be for the next two to three years? Well, so what the, so this, the second step of this, of, of this is that 
we buy these practices, we build them up, we run out of space. So mm -hmm. what we end up doing is we end up building, you know, we end up building out the space uh, if it's if we have space in the current location or we move it. So we've taken a two chair office and built uh, that I bought in 2015, uh, my second office. And um, and now that office is now a 17 chair office. And same thing with a three chair office. Now it's a 15 chair. I mean, it's it's just, it's it's that's when that's my biggest investment is, is building out these these larger offices. Um, but we're doing it like as opposed to doing a de novo from from day one and having no patients, we're building up the patient base, having that strong patient base and then building uh, a facility that, that that suits its needs. So that's that's a lot of what we're doing now. So so just so uh, I understand this, we, so you find uh, undervalued assets that no one else is really interested in. You come in, you you put limited investment into those, but you you use your know how that you guys have this experience to turn these offices around. You double them, triple them, even four x in some cases rather quickly, and then you run out of space. So then you reinvest back at one of the other offices. You go back to the beginning and reinvest, build that office up. When that's done, you move on to the next one. That's correct. That's correct. Awesome. So we, we could always have, the, yeah, the small, the smaller off the, the, the initial buys, we just have to have, you know, have to have a doctor in place and then to build out the bigger offices. It's a little, it's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, time consuming and, uh, and, and a lot more money. Yeah. So but I imagine because totally you're, ta totally you're, taking, you're taking a different approach, right? So you're taking a different acquisition approach. So I imagine you have to take a different, uh, recruiting approach when you're bringing these doctors in. Are you able to talk through some of that? Yeah, I mean, we we like we like to train our own our doctors. Um, we have a hard time, uh, you know. I mean, we're not buying. We're, again, we're not buying doctors in the prime of their career, their forties or fifties. We're usually buying doctors a little bit older than that. Um, but we like we like to, we, we 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 invest heavily in training. You know, uh, uh, doctors right out of residency who haven't worked in an office yet. We you know we we really do a good job with that. Um, you know, teaching, teaching doctors, you know, obviously going through dental school and going through residency, they, they have a foundation, but, you know, till, till, you know, it usually takes about four, you know, six months, maybe a year till wow. a doctor is really up to speed and, you know, and, 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 and it's a lot of time and a lot of money also. Yeah. Uh, so, from, so are you guys uh, pretty hands on part. with that? Are you pretty hands on with that? Or does do you have people on your team that yeah. help with that? Yeah, yeah, me, yeah, me, and we have a, we have me and my partners. We all we're all training in different ways. Um, it's not just it's not just dentistry. It's also how to talk to patients, treatment planning. So it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of guidance that goes into it. And the tr the truth is, that's what the young doctors want more than what they're getting paid. They want mentorship and guidance yeah. because ne then they have what they then they have a real skill going forward for whatever they want to do. Um, the other thing that uh, here, I'll, I'll make the fit for you. The other thing that people are uh, are uh, are very interested in is that we're doing a lot of digital dentistry. Is that uh, you know the doctors that are coming out, they want to do same. They want to use Cerec. They want to do same day crowns. They want to be three D printing using CT scans. They don't want to go to an, an office that doesn't have that technology and not using it because they, it's like it's a waste. So that's been a, another thing that's been very very uh, potent in our recruiting abilities. Is that we're using the right technology to uh, to teach with. Why, why do you think that people don't understand that you need to mix, like you figured out, okay, I'm going to take technology, I'm going to have Medicaid patients, I'm going to work these together and I get a positive outcome. Why don't other people do that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, so first of, all, first of all, not all my offices are Medicaid, just to just just to okay. be, uh, to make that clear. But I, but I like to be diversified. Um, but, but you're, I, but you're executing that on in, in your Medicaid offices, though, right? That strategy. Correct. Correct. No, correct. So, yeah. I, I, so there was a pro so going back seven years, you know, uh, when I when I first started, I had all these med I had I had a Medicaid office and I got the patients finally, you know, we're going to do a crown. Great. I prep the crown. I take an impression. I send it to the la lab. It takes two weeks. Maybe the patient shows up, maybe they don't. And if they do, if they do show up, then it takes 20, 35 minutes to get the crown because it doesn't fit right. So I needed some like I needed something that was more predictable, and they needed some quality control if I was you know if I was working with some people. So at that time, we I decided to start scanning at least, not not milling, but just scanning, and that proved to be fantastic. That crowns are coming back a little bit quicker, but they fit. Hmm. Um, and then we're like, 
I was with my brother and we were like, all right, this is amazing. Why don't we, why don't we do this in a Medicaid situation to not only scan, but also to mill crowns and do them in the same day. And that was, that was like an aha moment that was like blew our minds because I was asking around and nobody was doing this. Yeah. So, so time. yeah, I, I, mean, that, I, I, I mean, maybe someone is, I haven't heard anybody doing that. So what, what, but what do you think that's keeping them away from that? Is it just, is it the initial cost that keeps people away? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, some of it is cost. Some people, some, a lot of doctors think that, you know, in order to use technology, you have to have a, you have to have a high end office and we're using technology to create efficiencies mm. in order to be more yeah. profitable. So, okay. So, get, some, you know, so some able... people look at technology from a marketing perspective, like the patient wants it. You're looking at it from how do I get my doctors to be more efficient? Yeah, I mean, we, we, so we had some real questions when we started. So sometimes we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do a root canal, a post and a crown in the same day on a patient, given, given the right circumstances. We asked Medicaid at the time, can we bill for all of these at the same time? They had no idea. <laughs> so, okay, so nobody's doing procedures. it. Yeah, so nobody's doing that. Right. That's how we, we know no nobody's idea. doing it. So, so we, they, said, they said no, but we, we, but we were like reading through the manuals. We're like, it doesn't make any sense. We're completing all the procedures well, in default, one day. Right? So insurance, not... the insurance answer is, is default no, right? So if you ask anything, they're going to be no. But they didn't have anything in writing <laughs> against it, right? So what, what happened? No, it was fine. I mean, we've been, been, been we've been getting compensated for the last seven years for it. Um, no, but I, I know, but I also, but I also think it's it, it's it gets a deeper point here that when we're dealing with healthcare, or dental care, for the underprivileged, underserved, right? There's no reason why they can't get the why Medicaid patient patient can't get the best in technology. There's nothing. There's no reason for them to be. Why only people who are praying, praying privately or have a PPO insurance should be getting the best that there is to offer in dentistry? And that's that is something that I I I, I believe to my core, and something that I, that I am proud of because I, you know I'm only the hand, one of a handful of people in the country doing this. I feel like that's awesome. I want, I know one of the things on that same note is that you really like to help people and mentor people. I, you personally reached out to me and said, "Hey, Gary." Can we go help this person? Is there something that we can do for them? How did you get started in helping people that way? <laughs> I don't know. I, some, sometimes I just don't know how to say no, but it's <laughs> but it, no, but the truth, but, <laughs> but no, but the, but the truth, but the truth is that is that you know if I can help somebody, why not? You know, yeah, but it's it, not so it's, there's. There's, so there's one thing I will say this, and I'll say this on your behalf because I know you're not you're not trying to talk yourself up. The there's one thing to be like, hey, I'm going to help you, right? Like, hey, go left or go right. Here's 30 minutes of my time. It's another thing to like jump in with somebody and be like, I'm going to help you fix your practice and I'm going to really invest into you. And I, I've seen personally that you invest, and I've, I've heard from other people as well. So this is not just firsthand witness. I've also seen it from others that you really invest into people and you really enjoy helping people. And I, I see that trickle through to your office as well and see that with just everything that you touch. So that's really cool. I appreciate that. I try to be that way. I'm not probably as good as you are at it, but I, I try to be that way as well. And I think that's a... I, I, I can't... I mean, you, you're uh, giving me more credit than I deserve. But I, again, I, I do what I can because, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I haven't always been successful. Um, I've seen I've seen personally... Uh, other f members of my family fail uh, for different reasons, um, and sometimes when you could when you could just change somebody's life um, or, or, or pick them up or be be there for them in ways that nobody else can, then yeah, that you have a responsibility. I, I feel like I feel like that. There's it's just I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's my personality. Maybe that's one of my core values. Of, of kindness, but I, I really strongly believe that we're in this world uh, to not just make, not, not just for ourselves, but to help others. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's a good attitude to have. And it always works out when you, when you do that for sure. Now, another thing I, I wanted to talk to you about is you said there that you've been on the other side of the success track. So did you, did, when you came out of school and you were being a dentist, did, like, did you picture yourself where you're at now or did it, it did it kind of just formulate over time? 
I follow the breadcrumbs. So, so what happened was I worked for my father. I worked for my father and my father's a dentist and he had, a, he had two offices and one in the city and one in Brooklyn. And my first year out of, out of residency, when I worked for him, I did not make enough money to make ends meet. Um, I had to dip into my savings. I was kind of, you know, I was kind of forced, I'm not forced, but I was, I was already looking, but at, at the end of the year, I'm like, all right, I, I think I need to go on my own. Um, unfortunately, right after that, as I was leaving, my father got sick hmm. and then, and, and his, and his, both of his practices failed. Um, I wish I knew more at the time that I was able to help him, but, but, uh, I was able to help in different ways, but the point, but the point is, is that because he got sick and because he, his plan, he didn't have a real plan. Uh, his entire business was built around him. Yeah. That gave me the, uh, the, I guess the, uh, the pressure to build a business, not on myself mm. to, to share, to, you know, wasn't, it wasn't about EBITDA. It wasn't about forming a DSO. It was, it was strictly to build a business that wasn't dependent upon my health. Yeah. And that's, and that's really like every business person at first we get into it and we just want to build something. Right. But then it's like, Oh, this is really relying on me. If I'm not, if I go on vacation, everything stops. And then you, so you start thinking through that in a different way. And that, I think that's true in all business, but it's interesting. You learn that at a really young age and from your father. And so you, you, you went out, you started your own practice. Did you, did you just start like from scratch or did you buy a practice? What was that like the first practice? No, that was the first one I found on Craigslist. <laughs> that that <laughs> okay. was the first practice that, that I, uh, that I found. Um, it's coming up actually in October. It'll be 10 years when I bought that first practice. Uh, and it happened to have been in a location that I was eyeing and, uh, I had some really good guidance from a bunch of people and I was able to buy the pra that practice at the time for less than it would cost to build it from scratch. And I, I thought that was a good idea. Yeah. It's almost um, like when you see and, in these certain markets where it's like houses are 150,000 and you look at lumber costs and you're like, you couldn't even buy the wood for that house for 150,000. Right. So it's like, that's a yeah. good deal because you have at least that much wood in it. So I, I, I totally get that yeah. thinking. Now, did you, when you, when you are, you buy your first practice, you get it off of Craigslist. Is it, is that when the lights started to go off? Like, Hey, I can start to add more of these or was it, was it, did that take some time to build that out? The vision out, I know it takes time to build out more practices, but the, the vision of what you have now. No. So at first I, I, my, my initial goal was to have like one really good office open, you know, six days a week, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. And, um, so a year after I bought that practice, I had to double, I had to, I did a construction to double the size. I was out of space already, uh, took a three chair office to, and, and I doubled it up, uh, right. I went to the place next door, uh, I made it an eight chair office, uh, made every mistake on that construction. Oh man, that was terrible. That, I, I, I was so bad, but, um, but again, it was, that was, I was, I was 14 months into my, my business and I went back to the bank and saying, Hey, I need to expand this. I'm at, I'm, I'm at capacity already. That was, that was very cool. That is, um, awesome. and then, I, and then I, and then I realized that, you know, the, there was something to it. Um, but that was, that, that construction was a big deal because going from three to eight chairs was, 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 was a lot, was a lot of work. Now, most, uh, most of these offices, they're, they're rural, correct? Most of the offices you have are more considered rural? Yeah, so I'm in the Hudson Valley. Yeah, they're, 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 I'm about an hour or so outside of, uh, of New York City. Does, um, is that part of the, farther. is that kind of part of the strategy? Because your dad was in the city. So was there a reason that you were like, oh, I don't want to be in the city? Or was it well, just kind I of was, the way? <laughs> Firstly, I was sick of, go, of going over the GW every day. <laughs> okay, I, got it. I, I, went, I, went to, I, I went to high school. I went to college and I went to dental school and residency all in, all in Manhattan. I was, and then, and then my first year of work also, I was driving into Manhattan and Brooklyn. I was done. I, I, I needed, I, there's too much traffic in my life. So I went, I was looking, uh, I was looking to go the other way, going up, going up North. Um, Got it. So, and go ahead. Yeah, no. And that, and, and that was, it was, it was, that first office was the, was the most important decision I ever made. It's at, it's at the, why, it's at the, why was, it, the, why was that the most important? Because if, it may, if I made a mistake on the first practice, it would have taken me years to get to, to, to dig myself out of it. 
I not only did I get the right practice, I got the right location, mm -hmm. and there was something there was something there that I could build on. Now, was the location Wasn't was the, the location uh, luck, or was it strategy, or a little bit of both? No. No, it was definitely it definitely wasn't luck. Um, so I'm so that first office is located uh, at right outside of um, one of the, the fastest growing population in the United States of America. Uh, there's, it's a village called uh, Curious Joel, uh, a, Hasid, a bunch of Hasidic Jews, really nice people. Uh, I, I personally have, I have family that live there, and they, they and they told me uh, that they have issues finding a dentist over there. So. I just happened to have found a practice on Craigslist uh, where I was able to buy this, you know, we're in, in that location. Now I was, this, my practice is located outside of Curious Joel, like five minute drive outside of Curious Joel. In the last 10 years, every, my location has, has been swallowed up by that community. Mm. They bought every single house in that area, um, all the real estate, everything has been gobbled up and uh, what was once, you know, a quiet country road is now busy. So you, you really picked busy. the location based off of an underserved need uh, in a particular kind of community. Is that correct? Is that what it boils yep. down to? Or is there more to it than that? Well, again, I, again, I had inside information from family members that, yep. that, that live there. Um, if you want to look and just look at the population, you know, these are, this, this is, you're in a, you're in a, you're in a, uh, it, it, we're in a forest here and there's like a, it's like a city in a forest. You're talking buildings, you know, six family buildings and, and like, you just like, it's unbelievable how many people are there. And you just knew, you, you know, these, you don't, you don't, you don't need a report saying, <laughs> Oh, this is the demographics here. This is, this is like, all right, each of these families have 10 kids and they're popular and, and their, and their, their generation is, is uh, every 18 years, a new, you know, a new, a new generation is starting, you know? Uh, so you, it, it's it, you don't no report is going to tell you what what you can learn from just driving around and seeing what's there yeah i mean today i went i went uh i went i went to get lunch today i went to a pizza store i couldn't even get in there were just so many strollers it was just a parking lot of strollers inside the pizza store it's like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I had, I did a podcast actually but, earlier today with Hendrick and he's a, he's a dental consultant. And one of the things that we were actually talking about is how to find opportunity. And he brought up some, something similar. He said, you could go to some, you know, these, there's pockets of people who only speak uh, certain uh, dialects of Chinese, or you could go and keep your out, your office open later hours or there's still, I, I feel like dentistry still has all these pockets of opportunity everywhere. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I love Hendrick, by the way. I love, I love his posts. Yeah. He, he's, he's, he's an, he's a very, uh, very thoughtful. Yes. Um, and, uh, I, li I like his stuff a lot. Me too. Um, yeah, you, but there, but there's a, but there's, here's the thing. There's a ton of opportunity. Dent, what, what's beautiful about dentistry as opposed to medicine, uh, is there's so much opportunity, there's so much opportunity. Um, uh, and you just have to, you just have to be a little creative and find it and be willing to, uh, you know, Go, go a little bit out of your comfort zone. So right? where, you'll find it. If you were starting today, what would you do? Would you do everything the same or would you would you do, approach this a little bit differently now because of the landscape? Um, I, I wouldn't do any. No, I, I would do exactly what I'm doing. There, there's no reason. There, there, you know, it, I'm investing in myself. I'm investing in technology. I'm buying un, undervalued assets and I'm able to, to turn around. It's, it's, this is a winning formula. Why, why, why do anything else? Uh, there's no gla There's no, there's no glory being on fifth Avenue, but being broke. <laughs> there's none. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Is there, is there any other, uh, technology that you're using right now that you're really excited about that you think that's going to help you in the future? Oh, I, I love 3d printing. So like, love tell it. me, tell me about that. Uh, um, I, I don't know a lot. I mean, I know that what 3d printers are and I know, People can use, people use them for all kinds of things, but what what are you thinking? So base so how I use my Cerec now is that we scan the tooth, we design it, and then we mill it out of a out of porcelain, you know, Emacs or or zirconia or whatever material we use, and and then we bake it, and then we have a crown. It takes about an hour. Um, you know, there's now 3d printing where I think we're, you know, there are other, there are other things that we use it for with like really, um, 
deep cases, di difficult cases for hybrids and, and, and the like. But the materials are getting really good from these printers where, where I think in the near future, we're going to be able to 3D print crowns. Really? Um, this is where I think. So yeah, what would be our, the biggest difference? Yeah, because I, I don't. I, I mean, I get when, what you're saying when cost? they mill crowns. So when cost? they're cost is way cheaper. Way cheaper. We're talking less than less than probably three dollars worth of plastic or yeah, whatever, I, whatever the material is. I've watched YouTube videos where people are three D printing houses. So I know like that you can pretty much three D print almost anything. So then how do right. they? Well, you got to. Well, you need so the, so the, the, you know these companies need uh, to get FDA approval on on the material that goes in the, your mouth. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not a house, uh, so that's that's what that's what that that's what's holding it up. I think. Uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm I don't work in, in these yeah. companies. I mean, we use Sprint Ray. I'll give them I'll give them a shout out because they're they're fantastic. Um, and but the, but the materials are going to catch up and get FDA approval over the next over the next bunch of years. And so the cost on a crown could, you know, for our standpoint, could, could decrease. Uh, now we're three D printing instead of milling. It's it's a lot. It's very, you know, milling. These mills take a beating. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're yeah. printing things all the, all the time. Uh, they're noisy. Mm. The yeah, 3D the three D printing is like not almost as, no not noise, as, right? Correct. There's a lot less mess. Or it uh, could be a lot less. Yeah. You know, the, the the mills are make a ton of mess. Um, and what about space? Just, 3D printers it, are pretty small too, right? Yeah, I mean, you get a big one, but yeah, it's space is. It, 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 we're talking about we're talking about accuracy of 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 the, of the product. Also, we're talking about the strength of the product, the aesthetics of the product. As all these things get better and better over time, these are things that we're going to use. So, so now, not every company is going to be able. to. So, do you think like what's the cost difference? So, if I'm talking in, in time difference that you think you can get to, like what would be ultimately when everything's working properly, the way you see technology going, how much money could I save per crown, like percentage wise, and how much time am I saving? I mean, you'll. I mean, you could probably. Uh, you're, you're pro, you know retail on a block. You know, it's twenty five, thirty dollars, maybe a little less, depending how you're buying. You know, you, so you could be saving twenty dollars on just on that, but it, but it's also it could be faster. You may not have to bake this uh, these materials. Mm -hmm. uh, the efficiency is more important than the actual cost, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, because they've gotten the cost um, down it, a lot. And, 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 correct, but the, again, the, you know, right now you could three D print uh, like temporary crowns and, and 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 stuff like that. But when it when it gets to uh, you know permanent crowns, whatever that does happen, oh my gosh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be like kid in a candy store. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I I love to see you light up. What any other technology that you're seeing that's really helpful to um, just really optimize the the dental world from your perspective? That's unique. Um, I mean AI, AI. Oh man, AI. I got to say it over and over again. Uh, uh, the they're two. They're two. They're they're two forms. I mean, there's a lot of different AI. It's a big yeah. word, right? So you have like. So you have like automation for like claims, like from Zentist, and they'll be very happy that I that I call them out on this. But I should, they're they're gonna get they're, they're gonna awesome. get their, their that 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 company's gonna be really good one day. I mean, they're good now, but I'm saying like, you know, why you don't they're they're pro, they're things that people don't have to do, and they're gonna take that out of the equation. And then the other thing is is cons which I think is the most important and the most significant change in dentistry probably since the digital x-ray is is a company like overjet or pearl or whatever any of these companies that that are uh, helping uh the dentist diagnose caries uh where 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 it's going to be more systematized and and uh equal across the board where you're not going to have variations um i think that's you know that that's a really big thing that's, that that that's going to change dentistry uh when everybody's using this uh, do you mean um, like the consistency on times. the diagnosis? Like, so I've heard like yeah. people say if someone has a problem, yeah. they go to five different dentists, they get five different diagnoses, right? Like, like here's what you should do. That you're saying that the technology is going to standardize that a bit more. Well, it's going to yeah. Well, you're still going to get different opinions, but they're going to they, remember the technology doesn't have the the ability to diagnose for you. It's just it's just a guide mm -hmm. or an aid. Yeah, where where they're going to say, hey, check this area out. Uh, you know, on on that on that too. Got it. So you know. So, so less, so less, less things are going to be missed. That's a big, that's a big deal. Big, yeah. uh, but the consistency across the board, you know, you, uh, it, it will be great, but after, from a time saver, uh, and I hope they're listening to this, um, 
whoever dis develops a technology that can read the x-rays, a full mouth of x-rays, and then transfer into the patient's chart all the existing cavities, all the existing fillings. So, so my, oh, so, so my you don't have to make all the notes and there, say, yeah, they, all these problems are here, right? Correct. That's going to cut, that's going to, that's going to cut down on a significant amount of time. Um, they don't have that the yet. That's not, that's so not, in, that's, that's not standard yet. No, well, again, not from the AI. Got it. Not, not from, not from the AI software. Yeah. Cause it's AI software so, is very new. So yeah. that, that would be, that would be amazing. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that you think we should uh, chat about? Well, I mean, since I've, I've been, I've been listening to your podcast for, I don't know how many months now <laughs> and, we're, and we're talking marketing over here. So I got to give you my, my, uh, my, uh, my, my favorite marketing, uh, uh, what's called, uh I guess tool yeah, or yes. not, see a tidbit or whatever. So I said, it's not fair as I had time to think about it, but any of the jingles from the eighties <laughs> killed it, you know, <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, like slip and slide. Yeah. Or, uh, or, 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 or uh, Chia Pet. Anyone have Chia a jingle? Awesome. They, they so I got one for you. So I have <laughs> Aladdin bail bonds in my head because they play 1-800 uh, or 530 1177, your bail bond connect, whatever, right? Like they, there's an actual song and I know the song and I know the phone number. I don't know anybody else's phone number, but I remember the bail bonds <laughs> commercial from when I was like in like 10 years old. And, and because I heard it so many times, yeah, those jingles, they don't do that anymore because yep. you don't have to remember the, the phone numbers anymore. So they don't build those jingles like that anymore. Yeah, those jingles were the best. They were. I agree. The best. They stick in your brain uh, forever. You can't get rid of them. Uh, I'm, I'm not singing on your podcast, but I, 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 got, I got a bunch of them on top of my head. <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been a lot of fun. And I think that you have... A very unique perspective and you are doing something in the industry that not a lot of other people are doing like at least i'm not talking to them and i i appreciate that and i think that you're going to just continue to crush it because you are focusing on areas where other people aren't oh from your mouth to god's ears <laughs> but uh hope we hope we, we hope we, we hope to continue thanks dr faber i really, I really appreciate do. you coming on i appreciate your time my pleasure. Anytime. Awesome. If so, oh, last question. If anybody wants to connect with you, reach out to you to learn more about what you're doing, maybe come, you know, be an associate or, or kind of pick your brain. What's the best way to reach you? Well, if, find me on LinkedIn, got my name or you go, go, with, go with my, uh, uh, my email. I'll, I'll give you my official email. It's Mark Faber at smiles in Awesome. Thanks Dr. Faber. That's easiest way.